let's get to lecture two, CC one sixteen. Uh, I, you know, I left this open. I don't know how much I want to talk about academic integrity, but I just tacked it on really quick at the end last time. So I do want to uh, at least talk about it a little bit because I only got one really quick thing. Uh, told fish, there's not really Q and A this semester. I have CC four forty two right after this. There's a ten minute, uh, sorry, a twenty minute break in between, but that's all the time I have for Q and A. I see. Uh, so I don't have a ton of time for Q and A, uh, but I do hang out that twenty minutes in between lectures. There's no point in me trying to get something done during that time, so I do hang out and do a little bit of Q and A and a little bit hanging out. So. Academic integrity, I didn't really get to talk about this much last time. You've probably heard this speech tons of times, so I'll try to focus on the parts that are a little unique to our situation, or at least things that I think I can add that not everybody says. Everybody's going to tell you don't cheat, don't steal code. Um, also, don't give anybody code. If Whether you're the one copying or the one giving somebody else their code or in some way allowing somebody else to access your code, you're both in violation. That's F's for both of you. Uh, what I want to say about that is if you are tempted to try to help somebody out, it's always framed as, oh, I was just trying to help out my friend. I was just going to help them out by giving them my code or telling them how to write this one method or whatever. It's always how it's framed in those meetings that I have where the students break down and plead for mercy and everything. Uh, it's, uh, it's not helping. First of all, it's not helping your friend or whoever it is you're trying to help. It doesn't help them because they're just going to become dependent on that. Then the next assignment comes around, well, guess what? They still don't know how to code. They still don't know how to do the next one. They're going to be coming to you for there. That, and even if they make it through the course and they don't have you in the next course, well, they're gonna have to find somebody to cheat off of in 220, 250. And eventually, if they do somehow get a degree, well, they're not getting a job, or at least not a good one, um, once an, any competent employer realizes that they can't do anything. Uh, the other caution I want to give that you might not have heard is uh, your, your friends will often, at least from what I see in the meetings, from what they I'm told in the meetings, your friends will often say, yo, don't worry about this. I'm going to change everything around. By the time I submit it, it won't look anything like your code. Trust me. And then you give them their code. And what happens a lot of the time is they just submit it verbatim. These are not the most trustworthy people. They're not actually your friends. They're not doing anything to help you. They'll often submit it verbatim. And I've had students break down and just become completely open with me and say, man, I gave that person my code. They said they were going to change it. And I'll show them the uh, the results on it. I'll show them the code side by side. And it's just identical. They're like, they didn't change a damn thing. They didn't even change variable names in some cases. Uh, these people aren't looking out for your benefit. They're cheating because they don't want to do anything. Don't give them your code and let them drag you down with them. Uh, so that's my my advice there. Uh, and this one, I pointed this out quickly at the last, uh, the end of last lecture. But I want to re-emphasize this. This is the most um, uh, the most common thing, or at least one of the most common things that I see in those meetings is two students not necessarily cheating in their eyes. They don't think they're doing anything wrong. But they'll sit side by side, and this is, I assume, will be less common with COVID just because it's harder to do this. But they'll sit side by side in, like, the office hour area where they can both see each other's screens, and they'll kind of work on the assignment together. They won't really share any code, and they'll plead with me, we didn't share any code, I didn't send them any code, they didn't send me any code, but they just worked on the assignment together to the degree where both of their submissions look pretty much identical the variable names might be different and a few things might be in different places but it's the same code for all intents and purposes and when i see that it gets flagged i look at it i say wow these two people did you know they obviously worked on this together don't work on code together you're running that risk of your code looking so similar that it's going to be the same you can work on abstract solutions if you want to get together with your friends and say how are we going to solve genetic algorithm without variables and you want to say, well, maybe we should use recursion and have the recursion, the base case of the recursion end when the cost is not changing anymore or something like that. You want to talk at that level? Fine. If you talk at that level and then write your code separately, you're never going to get flagged by me. You're never going to be having the, uh, sitting in my office or sitting in my Zoom meetings. 
uh, with the COVID talking about academic integrity solutions. So just keep that in mind. You can work together. I don't want to scare people. I've scared students too much in the past, and then they don't want to work at all together. You can talk about the ideas together. Just don't talk about the code. Never get to the point where you're like, oh yeah, for that, I wrote a for loop. I declared a variable. Then I had that variable do this. Then I wrote a loop, um, you know, a function that takes these parameters. Don't talk at that level. Just talk at the abstract level. Uh, and the last thing I want to talk about with this is uh, I actually had a lot of students last semester. And this happens as a recurring thing in each semester in each course. It always happens. But last semester, it was more prevalent than ever. So I just want to address this one. I had a lot of students who had the same code for multiple assignments, a huge group of students, um, something like five to ten students on and off for each assignment. And the story that they all gave me was that they hired a tutor, and the tutor helped them with the assignments. So the, their code looked similar because they all hired the same tutor. Uh, that wasn't a tutor, if what they're telling me has any grain of truth to it. If that is what happened, that wasn't a tutor. That was somebody who's doing the assignment for you. Even if the tutor is like, now write for i in this data structure. Okay, now write val x equals this. If they're helping you at that level, that's cheating. Yeah, I'm, you might get away with it. I might not detect it if you do that. But as soon as two people go to the same tutor, well, that's two Fs and that's easy for me to find. So uh, that, that's, I mean, it, it should be obvious that that's, not acceptable but with the number of students that i have to meet in zoom meetings and uh, the number of students i have to face where they're in tears pleading with me and begging for mercy hate it uh, i said this last time but i hate it the students obviously hate it because that's uh, uh you know they have to retake the course they have to take it in the summer or retake it the next semester whatever they have to do to get back on track for graduation and uh you know, it just sucks. It, it sucks for me too. I, I don't, don't like doing it, but I do have to do it. I mean, it is part of my job to maintain the integrity of the degree. I have to protect the students who are doing what they're supposed to be doing, learning what they're supposed to be learning. Uh, so I will do my job in that regard. Uh, I don't want you, uh, and we actually had a problem with this. We had some master students who cheated on a, an interview, an interview with a company they had they gave them an, a, a problem to work on, they gave them some time, and then they could come back and show off their solution. They cheated on that, which is just absolutely atrocious, absolutely horrible. Well, anyway, it got back to us. We had faculty meetings about it the, where this company is looking at uh, blacklisting UB students. So even with your degree that you honestly took and did what you're supposed to do, well, that takes a hit because there's students out here who are so atrociously, blatantly cheating even outside of uh, even outside of academia, when they get in the workforce, they're still cheating. And then, of course, they're, that can cause lawsuits for your company if you do get hired and you do shit like that. Like, just don't. Uh, but it's my job. I have to at least police it. Yeah, don't obviously don't ask upperclassmen for answers to anybody. I mean, you have to create your own work. You have to submit your own work. You have to know the things that we're teaching in this class. Anyway, that's uh, I spent enough time on that. Um, I don't like harping on it too long. 10 minutes is probably already too long because honestly, the students who are going to cheat aren't listening to me anyway. They're still going to cheat. They're still going to have those meetings with me. I'm still going to tell them they're failing. They're still going to cry. It, there's nothing I can do to get these students to listen. So, uh, I don't like harping on it too long. Anyway, let's get into some content. Let's talk about Scala for the first time and get into some 116 content. So let's, uh... Check out these brand new slides. Well, not brand new, but new to us slides. Oh, man. I still haven't gotten used to this. With the So I have two screens. I have one screen that's... Uh, one screen that's just used for whatever's being displayed to you. And then the other screen, which is you know my command center where I can see chat and all that stuff. Uh, but I can still see that screen. I don't ever look at it directly, but I do look at it through OBS. So I always lose track of where my mouse is. If I it's over ABS itself, or it's actually on that screen. Half a semester, I still didn't get used to it, and 
Yeah, I'm still not used to it now. Okay, but we got there. <coughs> New language. Yeah, I have, so I have two monitors and my laptop. Uh, but I don't look at my laptop much. That's just to make sure the stream's working. Scala Basics. Let's talk about this new language and how it differs from uh, from Python. Oh, you know, I didn't do my slides in widescreen either. Uh, little things. We'll we'll get back on back in the rhythm eventually. Um, so let's talk about Scala. How it differs from Python and JavaScript. How it's the same and what you need to know to use this language. So hopefully you all have IntelliJ set up. Uh, Autolab is live, the roster's uploaded, and this lecture question is live on there, LQ0-1. Uh, so this week we do have two lecture questions. They don't belong in any, um, any of the learning objectives, but we do have two lecture questions, so I just call it you know, lecture learning objective zero or whatever, uh, null objective officially on Autolab. So here's our first task, your first Scala program to write in a package named lecture, create an object named first object with a method named compute shipping cost that takes a double representing the weight in pounds. I forgot my units here in pounds and returns a double representing the shipping cost of that package with this formula. Every package costs five dollars to ship plus 25 cents for every pound over 30 pounds. So every package 30 pounds or less costs exactly five dollars to ship. Uh, once we go over 30, each pound is an extra quarter, and we can have fractions of a pound, so you do have to handle decimals in this. So 31 pounds, that one extra pound is a quarter, that 10 extra pounds is an extra 250, 0. 0.4 extra pounds is an extra 10 cents, etc. Create your project in, uh, preferably in IntelliJ, that's what I'll push. Tell IntelliJ technically isn't required for the course. If you're, uh, you have a different development environment already set up, you're already comfortable with, go for it. Um, but all the examples are going to be given in IntelliJ, and I'll show you the process of how to create an IntelliJ project and submit an IntelliJ project. So when you're in IntelliJ, create a zip file, export your project as a zip, submit that zip file to Autolab, and then Autolab will grade that zip file. So this isn't very difficult. I mean, it's an if statement uh, and a method. Not too much going on here compared to what you know from 115. But this is primarily here to get you through the process of setting up IntelliJ, setting up a Scala project, submitting to Autolab as a zip file, just going through all the procedures and all the process of that, as well as getting uh, getting your feet just a little bit wet in, uh, in Scala code. So that's what we have to do. A lot of these things shouldn't make sense to you yet. Package, uh, object kind of can make sense to you. Method you haven't talked about in 115. Um, doubles, I think you talk about a little. Anyway, a lot of this might be new. As with most lecture questions, you shouldn't really understand what the lecture question is until we get through the lecture. So let's get through this lecture and talk about how to complete that lecture question. Why is it shown as null objective? Because these two, this week doesn't pertain to any of the learning objectives. So in Autolab, as I start, as we start getting into the learning objectives, there will be a category for each of the five learning objectives. This first week doesn't pertain to any objective, so I just called it null objective, um, just to just to distinguish that it doesn't have any associated learning objective. IntelliJ is free. Follow the links that I gave on, on the course website. It's uh, the IntelliJ Professional, which I recommend you use, isn't free, but you can get the academic license with your .edu license and use it for free. You can get a free license. So you don't have to pay for it. If you ever get to a point where it's telling you to pay for IntelliJ Ultimate, don't give them money, you know, unless you're in a very unique situation where you want to develop professional software and not be constrained by the academic license or whatever. But, uh, uh, but don't give them money, sign up for the academic license. Will we use IntelliJ in future classes? It's mostly up to you. I support IntelliJ in this class because I think it's the easiest way to get into the to this new language and the new... Uh, setting up the environment for you. Uh, so it'll be up to you. Once you get familiar enough, you might want to use something like VS Code or um, or Atom or something like that if you're uh, more comfortable with those. Uh, I don't believe Dr. Hughes... Actually, I don't know if he supports IntelliJ or not. I think he might also, in CC250, tell you to use IntelliJ for the same reasons I'm saying. All right, but let's get into this. Oh, yeah, and then you can get all the... 
IDs, all the um, JetBrains IDs, and get all those IDs with your academic license. I think they're great products. I like using them. They're clunky at times. Sometimes IntelliJ just decides that it's going to take up all of your CPU, and you just can't use your machine until it stops doing that. But other than that, it, they're, they got a nice feature set. They're nice IDs. So to set up a project, once you have IntelliJ set up, look for create new project, go to Scala, and idea project. This is, you could use any of these. We're going to use idea because that's uh, that's just how the examples are going to be set up in um, in lecture in the examples repo etc. Some of you won't see Scala right away. It will take a while to get all of you set up with with uh, IntelliJ. Come to office hours. We're starting to populate the office hours list. Go to those office hours. See us in Zoom. Share your screen. We'll help you get everything set up. There are some uh, some things that often trip students up. So, um, but that's what this week is all about. And next week's lab is all about getting IntelliJ set up. So let's look at our first Scala program, our typical Hello World. So this program, this Scala program, is going to print Hello Scala to the screen. Very basic, but we have some overhead here that we didn't see in either Python or Scala. So we do need at least most of this stuff. The package is kind of optional, but we're not going to treat it as optional in this class. We're going to have packages for everything. Um, but all this overhead should be here to get any program running. And then our code here, which is actually going to run and actually going to do stuff. In Python, this would just be print hello Python. In JavaScript, it would just be console.log hello JavaScript. Um, but Scala, we got a little extra overhead here. Those of you coming from Java who know some Java, you're used to this overhead. Those of you who are not, let's talk about it. Package is not similar to import. We'll talk about the, I'll go through each one of these. I have a slide for each part of this. Um, but package isn't, it, uh, isn't quite the same as import. So package is declaring which package this code belongs to. This, uh, this you can think of as being the same as the directory structure. It doesn't necessarily have to be the same as the directory structure. Uh, in Java, it does have to be one difference from Scala and Java. But it's highly recommended to still have this the same as the directory structure. So this code, this file, is in a directory, SRC for source code, where everything lives for your project, all the code lives for your project, and subdirectories, week one, basics. That's where this project, uh, where this code lives. And we use a dot instead of a slash in our package declarations. So that's just defining where this code lives. It lives in this package, week one basics. Create new package, right click on your source directory, new package. So you can create packages. They are different than directories. They should, um, they should call, um, they should follow the same structure as I mentioned, but they are different things. So don't go directory new, um, new directory <laughs> so yeah I'll, I'll try to tone down the java talk um you shouldn't have java experience coming into this class but i realize a lot of you had java in high school so i do mention it just for though that subset of the class there's no expectation that you have java experience so don't worry about that is source a root directory source is the root directory of your source code so it's called the sources root, which is one of the common issues you might see throughout the semester. If you fire up IntelliJ and just nothing's running, you have to right click source and mark it as your sources root. So whenever Scala looks for source code, it'll start in this directory and then start looking for code. So this is like the, the root of your code, which is a little different than the root of your project, which would be the directory in which source resides. All right, so we have our package. Let's create what's called an object. This is different than objects in JavaScript, so don't be confused with that, where object in JavaScript is a key value pair. An object in Scala is something that can hold variables and functions, which once functions are inside an object, we call them methods. So a little bit of terminology, a little bit of vocab here. Uh, I'll, we will actually talk about functions later in this course, and you've talked about functions in 115. 
and but there are slight differences between functions and methods. Most of what we'll see in this class will be methods, which means they live inside an object and they have a reference to everything else in that object, a reference to that object. That's stuff we'll get into when we talk about OOP, uh, but there are subtle differences. Objects are similar to classes. I uh, P803, I'm not going to go through all the numbers, but they're similar to classes. Classes are used to create objects. If you only need one object of a particular type, Scala lets you just declare it as an object instead of working with classes. Classes and objects we will talk about shortly. Not this lecture, though. We just want to get some basics down today. And finally, the main method. So the main method is the method that's going to run when you run this file as a program. So we want to run this object as a Scala program. Scala and IntelliJ, they're going to look for a main method with this exact header. It's going to look for this main method and then run that method. If it doesn't find a main method, you can't run your program. If it finds a main method, that's what it runs. So it'll always be def main args. Technically, you can name, this is a variable name, so you could change that part. But you have to have some name, args, colon, array of strings, colon unit equals, and then in braces, your actual code that you want to run. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll get through method headers, but for now, just know that this is going to appear, this exact string is going to appear somewhere in your code if you want to run your code as a program, which we often want to do. Not always, as we'll see later in the course, but we often want to do. Yeah, so it's like a C main, Java main. Any language has a main method. Python also has main methods, though you didn't see them in 115. You can define a main method in Python and then run your Python file as a script and have it run the main method. You can do the same setup. It's very common in in um, any languages. It's different than in it. In it, in it is the constructor for his Python class. Uh, but we're getting ahead of ourselves in the chat there. So, and then finally, the code that you actually want to run. So this is the code that runs print line, uh, ln short for line, which means there's go. it's going to print this to the screen followed by a new line character. So print this on its own line. Hello, Scala. And we finally get our program running. All right, any questions on this? Before we jump ahead, if I can make some fortune with Scala in the future, Scala is, uh, there was, I think it was GitHub released some statistics and Scala was one of, if not the highest paying language. Scala is up and coming. It is a language that's not too popular now, but is gaining a lot of traction. So Scala developers are not, uh, not very common yet. So no one Scala is a huge plus in industry. And as I mentioned last time, knowing Scala, it's very easy to learn Java, at least in my opinion. It's very easy to learn Java after knowing Scala. So if you want to get a Java jo job as well, that's out there for you. Can you explain why we use methods compared to functions? So methods are uh, the same as functions, except they live inside of objects. And methods have access to a reference to the containing object is the difference, is why they have different names. Because uh, it can seem silly, why do we need a new name for that? But methods do have that extra reference. Uh, that might not make too much sense now, but it will become important later. If you've ever written code where you use the keyword this, that means you were inside a method. What if I don't do the object part of the code? Then you don't have a program. Yeah, if you're, if you're missing any of this except for the package line, the package declaration, you don't have a Scala program. It's not going to run. And you can try it, fire up IntelliJ and, and give it a try. It'll give you all kinds of errors. Can you explain the unit part? Yeah, uh, I will get to the unit part. That's the next part that we're talking about. Is there a place to look at all this new vocab? Uh, I don't have like a, a condensed list of all the vocab. Uh, you'll just have to follow the lectures and make sure you pick it up as you go. And I'll use all the vocab throughout the semester. I'll reinforce it in most lectures. Void equals unit. Yeah, if you're familiar with void, unit is very similar. So is unit the return type? Yes. So let's get into that. Methods and variables. A lot of the questions are about other content in this lecture. So let's just move on. 
Uh, so let's look at a more complicated program and just get some more of the 115 stuff. And I should mention this week we're going to rip through most of modules 1 and 2 of 115. So the first half of 115 is going to go by in about two days here. So we're going to get a lot of content and a little bit of module 3. We're going to get um, a lot of uh, stuff really fast. I do that really fast because you, sh you are supposed to already understand these concepts. All I have to do is show you the Scala syntax. How do I do this in Scala specifically? So just learning the new syntax, these colons, these equal signs and stuff. That's what we got to focus on. The one new thing that we're learning is strong typing, which is going to come into play right now. So here's a, a small program. Even not knowing Scala, you should be able to follow this code and read this code. The trick comes when you're expected to write code like this. So we start with the main method. We run this object as a Scala program. We always start with the main method. We start by declaring a variable x equal to 7. We're calling a method. It looks like that's just multiplying 7 by 2 and then printing 14 to the screen. You should be able to follow that, but let's go through this step by step and talk about the Scala syntax involved and what all this extra stuff that you haven't seen before actually means. So let's start by the method declaration. So we're creating a method. It's a method because it lives inside an object and um, and is created using this def keyword, which makes it, um, which is how we declare a method. We use def, name the method, and then the, which is the same as what you've seen before, the parameter list, return type, and then the body of the method. So the new thing here is the type. You have to declare the type in Scala methods, the imp the type of each input parameter, and also the return type. This is new from 115 from Python, uh, from Python and JavaScript, where you don't have to declare your types. Scala is a strongly typed language. You have to have specific types everywhere in your code. This is something that won't go away. You have to be aware of this to program in Scala or any strongly typed language like Java or C++. You have to define, declare explicitly your types. So we do that by giving the name of the input parameter, just like we used to do in any language, followed by a colon, and then we specify the type of that parameter. In this case, a double. I want to have floating point precision, so I'm going to define it as a double. And that's with a capital D for what it's worth. Uh, capital D double. All types are going to start with capital letters in Scala. So, you know, it's going to be a capital D double. Don't miss your capital there. So this method, whenever this method is called, it has to take a double as its argument when it's called. If it doesn't, you're going to get errors. Scala will check all of the types and make sure everything's consistent. If it's not, you get an error. Your code doesn't run. It doesn't compile. Uh, it doesn't do, uh, doesn't, won't do anything. Following the parameter list, we have this extra little part of the method definition. You, after the parameter, the close of the parameter list, another colon, and then the return type. So this, uh, a double is like a float, yes. Uh, and I have, um, on Friday, I will talk about some of the types. Right now, I want to focus on how to define a method. And we're, my example uses doubles. The lecture question also uses doubles. So we'll just stick with that type for now. And then Friday, I'll introduce a bunch of types and then talk about the differences between them. But a double is a number with floating point precision. So we can have decimals, uh, similar to a float in Python. I, and uh, so this returns a double. We have a colon after the parameter list and then another type. That's saying this method is going to return a double and then it better return a double. If it doesn't return a double, then you're going to get errors. IntelliJ is going to yell at you. Scala is going to yell at you. Whoever you want to pretend is yelling at you. Uh, it's the compiler and at some level. Uh, is going to yell at you and you're not going to have... Uh, um, you're not going to have a working program. I, I seeing the word double so much, it's starting to to morph and lose meaning to me. <laughs> I, I'm a little distracted by that. It looks like doable. Uh, and then finally, an equal sign. 
then an equal sign, which is to say that this method name and definition, this declaration, is going to be assigned to this or this uh, declaration, this method declaration is going to be assigned this definition. So we assign it with the equal sign and say this method is going to be everything within the braces here. So uh, so this method equals, just the syntax for Scala, we have to have this equal sign here, braces, and then the body of the method goes inside the braces. So everything that we, all the code that we want to run inside this method goes inside the braces. That should seem familiar to you. White space doesn't matter uh, like it does in Python. Uh, this is more of JavaScript syntax where we have the braces. Anything in the braces is part of that code block. This method uh, doesn't have a return statement. Should be one of the first things that you notice, one of the, or at least one of the things that you notice when you look at this method. There's no return statement. Return statements are optional in Scala, and in fact, they are discouraged. And I don't think there's any place in the course in any of my examples where you're going to see a return statement. I could be wrong if I have, I think I had one situation where a return was just, just made my life a little easier in one of the examples. But uh, for the most part, you're not going to see return statements in Scala code. No return statements. Instead, the last expression that's evaluated during a method call or more generally inside a block of code is what that block of code resolves to. In the case of methods, that's what the method returns. So whatever the last expression which is, is, is evaluated, which in this case is taking the input and multiplying it by two, that's evaluated, it resolves to a value, then we hit the closing brace, so that's the value that's returned by this method. This is very important. This is uh, this is a big part of Scala is understanding this, and it's a big part of today's lecture question too, today too. And I'll explain uh, one of the common errors with today's lecture question once we get to that last slide. But the last method, or the last expression that's executed during a method call is its return value. So I don't have to do return input times two. I just have that as the last, uh, the last expression. That resolves, in this case, to 14, and then returns 14. Very, very important, and something that takes a little bit to get used to as well. So uh, here, we're going to declare a variable. Again, we're going to define our type. We're going to explicitly declare our type. I'm going to create a variable. I'm going to name it x. And then with the same syntax as we used for methods, we're going to put a colon and then the type of this variable and then assign it to its initial value. So I'm creating a variable named x of type double and assigning it the value 7.0. Since I declared this with var, we're going to see uh, var and val. These are similar to JavaScript's let and const, respectively. Var can change its value, a variable. Val, we'll see in a few slides, cannot change its value. It's val for value. It has one value, and it cannot ever be changed. Next, we're going to create another variable named result. And I'm going to do thing, something a little tricky and something that seemingly contradicts something I just said is we're not going to explicitly declare the type of this variable named result. We're going to create a variable named result with no type, and we're going to assign it the return value of multiply by 2 of x, which resolves to 7, and then the method call resolves to 14.0. The reason I can leave off my... Um, my type here is because Scala is pretty smart and the way it does things is it's going to infer the type by the return value of this method call. Now I would usually put my type here anyway just to be absolutely crystal clear about my intentions and what's going on. I left it off here just to talk about type inference in Scala. Since this method returns type double and the compiler is going to check and make sure that this always returns a double, there's a guarantee right here. This says, I guarantee this method will always return a double. So this method call is always going to return a value of type double. And since this always returns a type double, 
the compiler is going to say, okay, well, obviously this variable is going to be a type double because it can only be assigned to a double since that's what this method returns. So it is going to infer based on the return type of this method. So we can sometimes leave off our types there. I don't recommend it. I, I recommend always having your types just to be crystal clear. Sometimes I leave them off. I have a few examples where I don't have them, but... Um, well, if you make the result an integer, but the method is a double, Scala, in that specific case, Scala will convert that integer to a double for you. We can't make int with that function. It's always going to return double. But if we did, like in, if I deleted this line and just typed 4 without a decimal as an int, it would convert that to 4.0 for me when it's returned. Where does, where does the object come into play when running the code? For example, first object. So first object is just a container for our code. When we, uh, this is like the top level of our file. When we create a file or create a program, we're going to have this object declaration, and that's not going to end until the end of the file, at least for our purposes for the majority of this semester. Uh, so that's a container for all of our code. We have to have it there. If we don't, Scala is going to get mad. And we have to have a main method in there to signify, or we don't have to, as we'll see later. But for these first few weeks, we will have to have a main method which is going to say this is where you start running this program. And then it starts running here. Even though multiply by 2 was uh, appears first in this file, it doesn't execute first. Execution always starts at the main method, and then we call that method. Can there be more than one object? It's standard practice to have only one object per file. It just cleans up the code a bit better. We have ceiling or floor if you want it rounded. Sure, you can, anything you can code, you can do... And you memorize the syntax. Today's a lot about memorizing syntax. It's not too, uh, we're not really getting more powerful today. We're just uh, seeing how to do the things you already know how to do, but do them in Scala. So let's uh, get some conditionals, which is the last thing we'll learn. Loops are saved for Friday. Uh, let's see a conditional and also combine a conditional with the return value of a method. So we're going to do something a little bit tricky here just to make sure we all have the concepts down. Uh, is there a reason you wouldn't have your main method as the first method? It's typically the last method in a in a file, but to be honest, I, I can't even tell you why that's the case. I've just been doing that for so long. It's just kind of standard practice that I forgot why. But the main method is uh, can be anywhere. It can be the first one. But it's typically the last method. It's just, I don't know. That just stuck, and the community does that now. So, I don't know why. Uh, okay, so let's look at this code. This code, again, without knowing any Scala, you can guess how this works. In effect, with conditionals, the syntax is pretty much identical to JavaScript syntax for these. So there's not too much to talk about here. Uh, but not without knowing any Scala, you can pretty much read this. You start with the main method. We're going to call compute size of 70. We have these two values, large and medium, set to some values. And we're going to have some conditionals. Is the input large, medium, or small? 70 is going to be large, 50 is going to be medium, and 10 is going to be small because they're those. that's how these boundaries are defined with the 60 and 30. So it's going to print large, medium, and small. But let's see how it does that and why it does that. And also talk about this keyword val that we mentioned briefly in the previous screen, previous slide, uh, previous example, I guess. How do we call for input in Scala? Only need to create. Uh, actually, I don't know that off the top of my head. Calling for user input from the keyboard. I don't know the, the exact method off the top of my head. This is not something I... Uh, we're going to start using GUIs in this class, and that'll be our input-output. We don't need to do text input-output. Bail uh, isn't changeable. GUI. Oh, a GUI GUI, graphical user interface. Uh, so in this method, when once this method is called in the main method, and we're chaining together method calls here. I'm hoping I'm relying on you being comfortable with that from 115. I'm calling compute size of 70 and then using its return value as the input argument for the print line method. So I'm hoping you're all familiar with that and you're comfortable with that. 
um, or else I'd have to have twice as many lines here and it'd just clutter up the slide. So uh, first I create two constants using the keyword val. Since I'm using val instead of var, these variables cannot change. And you might wonder why would we ever wanna do that? Let's use var for everything. Uh, this is a good way of telling yourself, telling the compiler and telling other people on your team once you're out there in the working world working on larger projects. Tell everybody that this value should never change. You can count on this never changing. And since I'm using val, you can count on uh, you can count on the compiler enforcing that. If you ever try to change these values, you're going to get an error. The code's not going to run. The program's broken. It's not going to run. So val, these values cannot change. I'm going to create a value named large of type double and assign it the value 60.0. So this variable large will always store the value, uh, will always be assigned the value 60 for as long as it, it is in scope, as long as it lives. It will have the value 60. Medium will have the value 30. And finally, our conditional, very similar to JavaScript syntax. You should all be familiar with this from 115. For those of you who are not, if you transferred in and didn't see syntax like this, I mean, this is the syntax for most languages other than Python. So if uh, if you're in this course, you should be familiar with this. But let's go through it. I have a conditional. I have a conditional uh, if, which is going to take a Boolean expression. That Boolean expression is going to resolve to true or false. If it resolves to true, execute this code block. If it resolves to false, go to the next part of the if statement. In this case, we have an else if, so we're going to check another conditional. If this resolves to true, run this code. If it resolves to false, go on with the, con uh, the conditional. And in this case, we have an else, which means if you made it to the else, run this code always. Always run this code if you ever make it to the else. If Either of these are true, the else isn't executed. If the first one is true, the else if is not executed, we're just going to uh, run large and that's it. If this is false and this is true, we're not gonna reach the else statement, so we're gonna resolve to medium here. Uh, so this is how we're running code conditionally. There's three different things that could happen here and they're dependent on these two Boolean expressions. These two Boolean expressions are going to uh, determine which code is executed. So now the trick here is we're combining what you know about conditionals with something you just learned about Scala. The last expression that's evaluated in the call of a method is its return value. That's kind of a mouthful, but what that means is whatever's executed last is its return value. Well, what's executed last is conditional upon our if statement. So the if statement is actually controlling what the last expression to be evaluated is. So if the input is larger than our large cutoff, then large is evaluated. It's an expression, it's just a string literal hanging out by itself with not being assigned to anything. It looks like this shouldn't even do anything, but as soon as this line of code is executed or this expression which is a string literal is executed resolves to the string large hits this closing brace since these are both else statements else if and an else those are both skipped we reach the end of the method and large was the last expression that was evaluated during this method call so since that's the case large would be returned would be the return value of compute size. So this is a little tricky, a little different than what you've seen in other languages, just because we're not using the return statements. In other languages, you would say return large, return medium, return small, make everything super explicit and uh, and be clear what was happening. Well, I don't think print line is a returnable value. Print line doesn't return anything. Print line returns unit. That's something we'll talk about on Friday. We'll talk about some of the different types. Right now, we're just getting our feet wet a little bit here. Uh, so some of the tricks with this, some of the implications of this, the last expression that's executed during the call of a method is its return value. 
So if I have, and I also have a guarantee, that combined with one other thing, I have a guarantee that this method returns a value of type string. Since I have to return a value of type string, if I don't always return a value of type string, Scala, the compiler, is going to yell at me and it's not going to run my program. My program won't work. Autolab will just say there was an error. Nothing's going to work if we don't always return a string and input is a vocab word i mean when i say vocab word i just mean these are words you're going to have to know i i might not i mean yeah i guess uh, i guess during the interviews you might be asked for vocab but you should know all the words um that i'm talking about yeah return unit uh input parameter um i mean most of these are from 115 for today but you should know them just because you have to go through those interviews. Like you have to be able to talk about your stuff. Uh, but any, uh, but anyway, this has to return a string. The compiler will enforce this if you say I am returning a string and you don't always return a string. Even if you technically do always return a string, the compiler has to have a guarantee that you're always returning a string. So what do I, what I mean by that is this conditional being the last thing that's executed in this program and has an else statement guarantees that either this is going to run, this is going to run, and this is going to run, the compiler is going to check if all three of those conditions return a string. In this case, they do. So we're good. The compiler is happy. This is going to run. But if I had if input greater than or equal to large, else if input greater than or equal to medium, else if input less than medium, and everything else the same except I do an else if here. Since there's no else statement, that code will not compile. It will not run and it will be broken code because the compiler doesn't have a guarantee that you're returning a string. Even though you have all of the possible cases covered, since input is a double, it can either be large, greater than, you know, it's going to fit into one of those categories. But since you didn't have an else, the compiler won't figure that out. It won't know that. Um, that it's always going to hit one of those conditionals because it might not. Input might be null. So we might not actually hit one of those three. So the compiler is going to say, no, you don't return a string. And you're going to be like, I return a string. And you're going to yell at your computer. Uh, don't fall into that trap. Make sure you're always returning a string if you say you're returning a string. That's one of the common issues with today's lecture question. Make sure you're always returning something. Likewise, I can't put any code after this conditional if i put any code after this well now the last expression that's evaluated is whatever i put after this and this large medium small stuff in my conditional doesn't do anything because it doesn't affect the return value which is the only way that i'm um, the only way that i'm returning the proper value since i'm not storing these in variables or values at all Whew. all right so I'll do the demo, but let me finish this. Uh... Oh, it's actually two four. I'm still getting used to these times. I'm used to going to the 50 mark. Um, I'll do the demo real quick, but uh, but make sure your last line, your last expression that's evaluated is the return that you expect for this uh, for this thing is the most important part. So let's fire up IntelliJ. I fired it up before lecture. I must have single clicked instead of double clicking. I want IntelliJ. Mm, I'm not going to set that up right now since we're already out of time. Uh, but to start a new project, I'm going to go to File, New, oh my goodness, New Project, Scala. If Scala doesn't show up here, you have some setup to do getting your Scala, uh, Scala going. Maybe if I have time next lecture, I'll do a more in-depth example. I'll break my IntelliJ and then show you how to fix it. Uh, an idea project, name it whatever you want. Uh, example, I guess. 
and choose your JDK and Scala SDK. Scala does rely on the Java development kit, JDK. So you do have to have Java installed. Go to the links on the course website. Make sure you install Java 1.8. And I believe the course is compatible with up to 1.11, but I always get mixed answers on that, and I haven't done thorough testing. I know 1.8 works. That's what I use. So that's, uh, that's what you want to use uh, if you want to make sure there's no issues. Scala SDK, you have to use 2.12 point uh, whatever the highest subversion is. But 2.13, Scala 2.13 is not going to be compatible with this course. I know that's a little annoying because that's the default that IntelliJ is going to install for you. But 2.12 is what you have to use. 2.12.12 uh, is released. Cool, cool, cool. Uh, I got 11, but uh, get the latest one, get the latest features. 2.12, obviously, since they updated it since last semester, they're still supporting 2.12. 2.13 came out more recently, and the Scala developers are still supporting both of them and updating both in tandem. Both are still valid Scala versions. Finish. And it opened a new window for me. And I have my project set up. The source folder, this is where all your code is going to go. If I'm creating a new package, I'm going to go down to package here. And let me double check my slides to make sure I don't lead you astray. In a package named lecture, create an object named first object. So I will create package named lecture. And then right-click Lecture, do New Scala Class. But I actually want an object, so I have this drop-down, this option, to click Object. And then First Object. And that's actually going to create part of the structure for me. And one of the nice things of an IDE, we have to have that main, we have to have def main args. You know, we have to have that whole thing right here to be able to start our program. IntelliJ, if I just type main and hit enter, it's got me covered. So don't worry about memorizing that. We don't want to waste, waste brain power memorizing this string until you have to know what that means. Just, you know, type main, enter, done. Then, so I want to recreate the example from one of the examples from lecture. Oh my goodness. And then when you want to run your program, you can right click over here and go to run. Or you can hit these run arrows here. You got all kinds of options here. Once I run it, so you notice how this icon, there's nothing up here. It's all grayed out. Once I run this, which takes longer than Python or JavaScript because this is a compiled language. We'll talk about that a little bit next lecture. I get my Hello Scala printed to the screen. Once I run that, these buttons are activated up here. And then if I want to run it again, I just click this thing. This will click whatever the last program you ran was. So it's a quick shortcut to just be able to rerun whatever program you're working on. You're working on one of the homeworks. You don't want to always you know, right click or click, uh, click, click. You know, cut down your clicks by at least one. Just click this thing right up here. So that's where, you know, I'm a little over. So let's uh, stop lecturing here. But uh, I'll, I'll gear down and read some chat and chat with y'all. But that's generally how you're going to create. Oh, wait, one more thing, actually. Uh, to, uh, to submit to Autolab file, export to zip file, save your zip file. Make sure you remember where you saved that zip file and then submit that zip file to Autolab. Uh, I'm not logged into Autolab, so I can't show that part of it right now, but um, maybe I should. Maybe I will during the Q&A. Um, but make sure you remember where you saved that. I've had too many students absolutely driving themselves insane. They come to me in office hours. What am I doing? And uh, the problem was that they saved their zip file in one location, and then they started saving their zip files in another location, but they were still submitting that first zip file. So no matter what they changed on their program, they were submitting their old code from forever ago. 
And they're like, why is Autolab always saying the same exact thing? Well, that's why. Please don't save your zip file in the middle of your project. I mean, you could. But but whatever you do, make sure you're avoiding saving the submitting an old zip file. And I've seen this. I've only seen this on Windows. But sometimes when you do export to zip, it doesn't uh, uh, it doesn't save all of your changes. So IntelliJ does have autosave. Like if I add this, close my project, and then open it up, that's saved for me. Auto saves all the time. Fantastic feature. Uh, I got addicted to it. Now any program that doesn't do auto save, I end up losing stuff. But it'll auto save. But for some reason in Windows, sometimes when you do export to zip, it won't catch all of those auto saves. So you have to manually do a save all in Windows before you zip. If you have a Windows machine, I'd recommend just getting in that habit. It it always happens, especially early in the semester when students aren't expecting that. Uh, and for some reason, only on Windows machines are the only ones I've seen it. Save all and then export to zip. And then submit to Autolab. In Autolab, how to... I'm not logged in. Maybe I'll log in. But, but it's the very first thing. But it's the very first thing on the course website. get 2F8 here. Hopefully I have my phone. Yeah. Get my phone right here. When is lecture? Uh, Phil, you don't have to type in all caps. It's not uh, entirely necessary. So once you're logged in, it'll go right to the course when you click that. I, you know, I have all the courses on here, but uh, but it'll take you right to the course. Null Objective for Scala Program, LQ01. Lecture due date, please. I mean, um, so I talked about this yesterday. So I already know you weren't completely paying attention yesterday. Uh, I recommend rewatching that video if you're having these kinds of questions. But the due date is uh, a soft deadline of midnight uh American hates to read all caps too. I think everybody hates reading all caps. Just, I mean, it's the equivalent of shouting during a live lecture. When is this due? Like, you wouldn't do that, but you're doing it in chat. Anyway, I'm not going to harp on that too much, but um, on internet etiquette and stuff. Maybe I will if it gets out of hand. But anyway, uh, so it's a soft deadline of midnight, the day of the lecture. What I mean by soft deadline is this is like a recommended deadline. This is when you should be able to finish each lecture question. Every lecture question, uh, you should be able to finish it by midnight that day, midnight Eastern time, since we're all in different time zones now. Uh, that's when you should be able to finish it. If you don't finish it, uh, again, remembering back to yesterday's and how you, right, yes, Monday's lecture, and how your grades are determined. If you don't finish it by midnight, that doesn't mean you automatically get an F in the course. That would be absolutely absurdly ridiculous. Uh, so you do have until the end of the semester, the at midnight, the last day of class, which is December 11th of this year. That is, after that, I won't accept any more lecture questions, but you technically have until then to finish those. If you're looking at this is the actual deadline, which in reality it is the deadline, it is the actual deadline. If you're looking at that as the deadline and counting on that, you're probably going to fail. I will give you that caution. It's highly recommended that you keep up with the lecture questions. If you don't complete a lecture question before the next lecture, you're not going to know what's going on in that lecture. You're just going to start falling behind. And once you start behind, falling behind, especially uh, once students get a uh, this class isn't quite cancer it's uh, it's just a lot of work and uh, once you start falling behind especially students who fall behind by multiple learning objectives if you're two learning objectives behind and we're in learning objective three we're halfway through the semester and you're still working on the early stuff on learning objective one uh, there's no get coming back from that the content of this course is like a fire hose 
which is uh, you can 6c that's where that comment's coming from the content just keeps coming and coming and coming every lecture is going to introduce new concepts for the most part there's like one or two where i give you a little bit of a breather uh, but there's a lot to get through if you start ignoring this deadline and paying attention to this deadline uh, it's just a recipe for failure and you'll be looking at either dropping the class or failing it just not a not a good idea but your grade will not be impacted until the last day of class is the short answer do not rely on that i cannot caution enough against that it's uh how do I join Autolab? So I added you all to Autolab. I added the roster. I did that yesterday. So if you just added the class this morning or last night, then uh, you have to wait for me to update. I'll upload, re-upload the course roster with everyone who added. What if I want to make it so that I can print a string and the else will print an int? How will that work in Scout? What if I want to make it so that one if will print a string and the else will print an int? How will that work in Scala? It'd be... So the example I showed, you didn't don't have to... I wouldn't use a method call for that. I would say if, you know, some conditional... I would do it inside the conditional itself. But you, but if you're using the return of a method, that method has to have a specific return type. You would have to choose string or int. You can do, there are ways to get around that, but they're discouraged and for good reason. Uh, so I wouldn't do that inside a method call. I would do that just uh, in the conditional and reorganize the structure of the program. Good luck, Hippo. Where do I find the homework? None of the homeworks are posted yet. I'm going to try to post all the homeworks for each learning objective on the Monday or before the Monday of that learning objective start date. So over the weekend, I'll finalize the homeworks for program execution and release those by Monday. And then I'll talk about them on Monday. We going to die. It's a, uh, look, it's a tough course. The, the, what I talk about day one, it's not, those aren't hollow threats. I mean, they're not threats at all, but this course takes a lot of time. I plan on spending that um, 12 hours per week at a minimum, or this class will destroy your life. It's not an understatement. You can ask, uh, I recommend talking to upperclassmen, um, talk about, talk to the TAs. Uh, post on, I don't know, post on UB Reddit, go to the UB Reddit Discord or whatever, and ask students who have been through this class if that's, you know, me just blowing steam. Oh, yeah, 12 hours a week. Because a lot of courses, I know you've heard that a lot. This course, 12 hours a week, or you're going to fail. You hear that a lot. Um, I've heard that as a student. I've heard that in classes where I haven't didn't do anything except show up to lecture. I didn't work a single minute outside of class. I would finish the homework before lecture was over and just listen to lecture in the black background, still get an A. But still, at the beginning of lecture, they would be like, this is going to take 12 hours. You should spend three hours outside of class for each hour inside lecture. I'm like, yeah, right. It's true for this class. This class is going to do that to you. Yes, you should create an Oracle account. It, it's unfortunate Oracle wants everyone to create an account. If they didn't, then the JDK could just be packaged with IntelliJ. But unfortunately, Oracle... They're like oracles run by lawyers these days. They want you to do some uh, do some extra crap. So you do have to register for an account. It's fairly painless, but you do have to register for an account before you can download the JDK. How did you create the package in IntelliJ? I went right-clicked my source folder, new package, and then give it a name. Yeah, in 250... 250 and 220, it only gets more intense, by the way. This is not the last class where that's a serious caution. At least 20 hours if you're new to Scala, maybe. Oh, yeah, to coding. If you're new to coding, yeah, 20 hours might not be enough. 
if you pass 116, then 250 should be easy. Uh, it, it depends how you pass 116. And that's why I changed this grading structure. Uh, in the past, I've had students pass 116, even with pretty good grades, but they didn't really understand linked lists, trees, and graphs. And then going into 250 without that background, which is crucial for 250, because Dr. Hughes is going to assume on day one of 250 that you know what a linked list, a tree, and a graph is. You know the structures. You're familiar with some of the algorithms with them. If you don't, then, you know. But, um, but with the change in the grading, it's designed to prevent you from failing 220, 250 if you get through 116. Because I had an issue with that in the past. I was passing students who, you know, just skipped certain topics and then failed the next semester. I don't like seeing that. I want to see you pass. I want to see you succeed. And I'll get fantastic jobs out of college. Get your dream job. That's what I want to see. Oracle's such an ass. They messed up my SQL. Yeah, they, they're they an interesting company these days. They I feel like they've gotten away from their tech roots. They're just run by lawyers and business people now. That's the impression I get. I could be wrong. I'd be happy to be proven wrong. But that's the impression I get from that company. JDK 8, JDK 8 and Scala 2.12 point whatever the latest one is, apparently 12 right now. I'm ready, coach, put me in the game. Yeah, you got lecture question 01. You ready? Um, some of you already finished it before lecture, I saw, so maybe you're one of them, but do any UB classes teach Java? Some of the upper level classes might use Java, but they'll expect you to learn it on your own. We don't have any we used to have one fifteen and one sixteen both in Java and we've gotten away from that because it just wasn't preparing our students for success the way we wanted it to. So we changed it. So now you're exposed to three languages early on with the idea that you'll be able to learn that fourth, fifth, sixth language very quickly because you're you've seen the same concepts in three different languages already. And in two twenty you'll see if your fourth language in C Every every developer should treat learning a new language as no issue at all. It shouldn't be any problem for you to learn a new language. And that's where we want to get all our students to. Learning a new concept should be tougher. You're going to learning new, uh, new theories and concepts and, and uh, algorithms and things like that. That'll always be tougher. How does a... a uh, an operating system work and function you know that's new stuff but if that class is taught in a different language that should be no problem for you that's the goal this learning scholar should be the last time where learning a new language feels like any burden i shouldn't say any it, it's going to be some but it shouldn't be something you stress about all right it's i got one minute till 442 Assembly, please. Oh, well, maybe assembly is an exception. And actually, C is going to be an exception as well. I, I shouldn't speak so broadly. C in 220, and Dr. Um, Dr. Blanton will understand that. He'll know that C is going to take some time. Um, and yeah, assembly, we have a whole course where it's pretty much teaching you assembly. Yeah, those two are going to be tough. Those will be painful. But what I mean is, after this semester, you want to learn C++ or Java. C++ plus plus is quirky but these days i think they got a lot of that out of it um c plus plus java you know any of the big languages shouldn't be an issue any big high level language